Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our first seminar of the year. Uh, we are honored to welcome our first speaker for this year's SOMA seminar series, Dr. Danielle Bassett. The Seminar for Outreach and Minority Advocacy, also known as SOMA, was developed to give a platform for underrepresented minorities to discuss their science as well as their personal journeys through academia. The goal of SOMA is not only to uplift underrepresented voices, but to also establish changes at individual, community, and institutional levels to be more inclusive. We have a great lineup of speakers this year, including talks from Julio Martinez Trujillo on November 12th and Mike Yassa on April 15th. We hope you will be able to make those seminars too. With that, I would like to start off uh, the year by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Danielle Bassett. I will pass it off now to Sasha to introduce her. Thank you. I am excited to introduce you to Dr. Danielle Bassett, who is currently a professor at UPenn. At UPenn, Dr. Bassett runs the Complex Systems Lab, where she and her team use tools from complexity science to study biological, physical, and social systems, like the brain. Previously, Danny completed her PhD in physics at the, at the University of Cambridge in the Cavendish Lab and postdoctoral training at UC Santa Barbara with Jean Carlson. In 2013, she joined the bioengineering department at UPenn. Since then, she has also joined the departments of physics and astronomy, electrical and systems engineering, neurology, and psychiatry. Lastly, this year, she was added as an external professor to the Santa Fe Institute for Complexity Science. Danny has written over 500 publications, with over 100 publications in 2020 alone, many of which are highly cited in PNAS, Journal of Neuroscience, and Nature Neuroscience. Danny has an H index of 62. <laughs> Research in her lab spans, the disciplines, um, spans disciplines with projects that use network analysis of brain dynamics, knowledge acquisition, and biological materials, to list a few. Danny has also received countless awards, notably the MacArthur Fellowship and the NSF Career Award. And with that, please join me in welcoming Daniel Bassett. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here uh, and to be part of this very important um, uh, effort. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen, make sure you can see. Okay. Everything good? Great, excellent. Okay, so here we go. Uh, so what I wanted to tell you about today was some work that we hope will be a, uh, incite all of you to take some action to realize um, an equitable future and to tell others um, ways that we can do that together. So, um, but before I get to the activism part, I'm going to begin with a little bit of literature. So here's a passage from Arthur Benson's Rossetti. So Arthur Benson is, is I think my favorite biographer and he wrote this wonderful biography of Rossetti and he talks specifically about the way that Rossetti writes and he says you know we find such lines as the unfettered irreversible goal or sleepless with cold commemorative eyes or note such textures as oh what is this that knows the road I came the flame turned cloud the cloud returned to flame the lifted shifted steeps in all the way that draws round me at last this wind warm space and in regenerate rapture turns my face upon the devious coverts of dismay. Or, ah, uh, who shall dare to search through what sad maze thenceforth their incommunicable ways follow the desultry feet of death. And now Benson's talking again after having quoted Rossetti and he says, it will be observed in these last quotations, there is a certain slight shifting of the usual meanings of words like commemorative, regenerate and incommunicable, some slight nuance added to them, which is not found in ordinary speech. This preciosity has a charm of its own and upon this handling of language, this delicate straining of the use of words depends much of the pleasure derivable from the works of masters of elaborate style. And I really like this last part, the, the way in which Rossetti is using language is stretching or straining the meaning of the words. So the way that I think about words is quite, you know, mathematical, um, just because that's my, my background and the way I think about things. So I imagine words are vectors like this, um, and that uh, as we go through life or go through um, 
uh, reading a passage from Rossetti or go through a conversation, the meaning of a word can shift or can be strained by its surroundings. And that shift or strain in its meaning requires some amount of energy. So let's say, you know, the delta, the change in energy or the minimum change in energy is something well defined. And that maybe changing this word in this way is fairly easy, has small delta E min, but then changing the word in this other way requires a lot more energy. Um, so then I thought, well, let's think about what are some of the drivers of changes in meaning of words or of concepts? What are the factors that can and do drive these changes? And I think the answer is that words can change their meaning over many different timescales. The one that Rossetti or that Benson was talking about in Rossetti was a very short timescale. Just a single passage from a good book can change the way that you're thinking about the meaning of a word. But if we go to a much longer timescale, maybe the meaning of, an, of the reading of an entire book, um, that can also alter your concept of a word's meaning. And I wanted to highlight this fantastic book from Ben Barr's The Autobiography of a Transgender Scientist, which makes you think really differently about advocacy, about glia, um, about mentoring, about all kinds of things. Uh, highly recommend. And then it, on even longer timescales, there is certainly a shifting of meanings in different cultures and as a culture changes over time. And for this time scale, I would highly recommend this book from Kareem Chama and Evelyn Fox Keller called Cultures Without Culturalism, The Making of Scientific Knowledge. So from all of these different examples, we can tell that meaning and concepts can change um, over different timescales and due to many different factors. And I'm going to give you a few examples, one related to curiosity, one related to society, and then one related to science. So in terms of curiosity, think about the word imply. In the 14th century, imply meant to enfold, enwrap, or entangle. The meaning of to involve something unstated as a logical consequence was first recorded in 1400. And that of to hint at, which is often how we use it now, is from the 1580s. Now in terms of society, uh, th let's think about the word impertinent. In the 14th century, it meant unconnected, unrelated, and not to the point. But the sense of rudely bold, uncivil, and offensively presumptuous, which is sort of how we use it in some ways now, is from the 1680s. And that's from the earlier sense of not appropriate to the situation, which came around the 1580s. So as you can see from these two examples, the best place, best time to be living was in the 1580s when all the words were changing their meaning. Um, but I want to move on to the third example, which is in the context of science. And here, rather than showing you a word that has changed its meaning, I want to show you a word whose meaning needs to change. And that is the meaning of the word scientists. So what does the word scientist mean to us as a culture, as a collective of investigators? Well, there have been several different studies um, published quite recently that show us what we appear to think the meaning of scientist is. And the first meaning that we appear to associate with the word scientist is the, a person who looks masculine. So this is a paper um, that was published in 2016. And what the investigators did is that they took pictures of actual faculty members in STEM, so science, technology, um, engineering, and mathematics at elite universities. <clears throat> and then they had participants rate each of the pictures for masculinity, and femininity. And so they, they rated how masculine and how feminine everyone was and then ordered those pictures uh, according to that criteria. Then they took a separate group of participants who rated each of those pictures for the likelihood of being a scientist or an early childhood educator. And participants very consistently assumed that the feminine looking women were early childhood educators. The more masculine looking women more, were more likely to be scientists. There was no such um, variability across the pictures of men. And so what's, what's interesting about this is that every single picture is of a scientist, um, but it demonstrates the fact that there is a assumption um, that a scientist looks like a man. Okay, there's also another study that pushes that meaning a little bit further. It's not just that scientists, number one, appear masculine, but number two are men. And this is a paper that was published in 2019 in Nature Geoscience. And what the investigators did is that they had 1,224 letters written for 452 applicants, so averaging about 2.71 letters per applicant, by 1,101 recommenders from 54 countries, really huge endeavor, um, over the period of 2007 to 2012. And what they found is that women applicants were only half as likely to receive excellent letters versus good letters in comparison to a man applicant. 
The men were described as being brilliant, rising stars, pioneers, geniuses, and trailblazers. The women were on average described as, being, as having a solid skill set, a good track record, strong knowledge, they were intelligent, and they had an aptitude for learning. Um, now, the third component or dimension of the word scientist and its meaning in our culture today is um, not just that they appear masculine or are men, but they also appear to have a man gen gendered name. And this is a really interesting piece from 2012 and published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Scientists, where the investigators used a randomized double blind study of 127 faculty across physics, biology, and chemistry departments from research intensive universities. And they had all of those faculty rate the application materials of a student. They had a CV, they sent it to the faculty, and they put, they used the same CV, but either put a man's name on it or a woman's name on it. And then asked the faculty to rate whether or not they would um, hire that person for a laboratory manager position. And what they found is that the applications that were assigned a woman's name were deemed less competent, less hireable, offered less mentoring, and offered $3,700 less in salary than an identical application that was assigned a man's name. And I want to emphasize that this is not actually the privilege of a gender. They didn't, nobody knew the exact gender of the person whose CV they were sent. This is simply the privilege of a name. It's just based on the name itself. Nothing about the self, the identity of the person. All right, so these are just three studies. I could have gone through many others or pulled another sample, but these are three studies that um, canvas or sample the broader field that has reported gender and racial inequalities in academia and industry in terms of compensation, grant funding, credit for collaborative work, teaching evaluations, hiring and promotion, productivity and authorship, and citations. What's interesting about this conversation and this um, field is that most of the uh, focus has been on the role of people in positions of power, like journal editors or grant reviewers, agencies, department chairs, and society presidents. Despite the fact that many of the imbalances are caused and actually perpetuated by researchers like me, or researchers at any level of the um, scientific, um, I don't want to say enterprise, because I don't really like that word, but uh, in the sense of science, the, the goal of searching for truth. Um, Okay, and citations is a really good example of something that we all engage in with every paper that we write. And in fact, what um, recent studies have shown is that people from marginalized groups are broadly undercited by everyone, including you and me, impacting their visibility, slowing or stalling their career advancement, and precluding an unbiased trajectory in the search for scientific truth. There's evidence that we tend to choose new research directions from highly cited papers, and that's evidence from Science of Science. There's also evidence that papers written by men are cited more than papers that are written by women. And therefore, we tend to answer questions that are posed by men, and particularly white men, and I'll get to that later. And thus, the trajectory of scientific discovery and the crystallization of collective knowledge is biased away from the ideas of minority thinkers. But what is the extent and what are the drivers of citation imbalance in science and how can we mitigate it? Well, so um, Jordan Dworkin, who was a graduate student at the time, but who is now an assistant professor um, in the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia, he decided to tackle this in a very quantitative statistical way. Um, and he said, let's examine the authors and reference lists of 61,416 articles published between 1995 and 2018 um, in five top neuroscience journals. We're also working on physics at the moment. And these top neuroscience journals were reported by Web of Science to have the highest eigenvector scores. They included um, Nature Neuroscience, NeuroImage, Neuron, Brain, and um, Journal of Neuroscience. Then what we did is that we assigned the term man or woman to each author if their name had a probability greater than or equal to 0.7 of belonging to someone labeled as man or woman according to the Social Security Administration database or the gender API. And I want to put 
upfront several disclaimers or descriptions of limitations here so that you understand um, what, what we did, what we can infer from it, and, and what we didn't do and what we can't infer from it. So first of all, um, I want to emphasize the distinction between sex and gender. We do not have any information about um, people's sex and that's not what we're characterizing. So I will use the term man and woman. I will not use the term male and female. Secondly, in our analysis, the term gender does not refer directly to the sex of the author as assigned at birth or as chosen later, nor does it refer directly to the gender of the author as socially assigned or as self-chosen. It is simply a, um, an assignment that's based on the probability of a person of that gender having that name. Also, I want to mention an important limitation, which is that this binary man, woman, gender assignment that we use is not well accommodated to intersex, transgender, and or non-binary identities. And that's something that we acknowledge as a limitation and something that we hope to overcome in future um, efforts in this line of research. We want to be able to see, see them um, and to same appropriately and et cetera. But for right now, with the tools that we have, our, our highest probabilities are for this binary gender assignment. Um, okay, so that brings me to just setting the stage with the data. So here what you can see is the predicted gender of authors over time. So we start on the left hand side at 1995 and we go up to 2018 over here. In purple what you see is the percent of papers that have a man first author and a man last author. And you can see that that was 64% um, in 1995 and has decreased to 50% in 2018. And the, uh, that decrease is being coupled by an increase of papers that have a woman in the first author position, in the last author position, or in both first and last author positions. That last category started at 7% in 1995 um, and is now up to about 10% in 2018. The increase is a rate of uh, roughly of articles with having a man or a woman as either first or last author or both is about 0.6% per year. Okay, now we wanted to test a couple explicit hypotheses that were based on prior work in political science, communications, astronomy, um, and astrophysics, and I'm missing one, international relations. Um, this, first, this first hypothesis is that there will be an undercitation of women, and that's based on work in these other fields. So for each of 31,418 papers published between 2009 and 2018, we looked at them and we looked at who they cited in the past. We took the subset of its citations that had been published in one of the above five journals since 1995 and determined the gender of the cited first and last authors. And importantly, we did remove self-citations as well, so those were defined as cited papers for which either the first or the last author of the citing paper was first or last author. And the reason that we did that is that we didn't want to be biased um, by the gender of the person who was actually writing the paper and citing themselves. Um, then what we did is that we calculated the number of cited papers that fell into each of four author categories. And I'm going to stick with these four um, papers that have a man in the first and last author position, so MM. Uh, papers that have a woman in the first position and a man in the last position, uh, papers that have a man in the first position and a woman in the last position, and then a paper that has a woman first author and a woman last author. And then now the next question is, now that we've gotten the data sort of wrangled together, how do we estimate over or under citation? How can I say that one group is being oversighted or being undersighted? Well, a, a one place to start um, is just to say, let's imagine that every reference list just randomly draws 50 to 100 references from the literature. And because there are more papers that have a man first author and a man last author, I'm more likely to draw those kinds of papers than I am to draw papers with a woman first author and a woman last author, because they're very rare. So we call this the random draws model. And to do the random draws model, we calculate the gender proportions among all papers published prior to the citing paper, thus representing the proportion among the pool of papers that the authors could have cited. And we multiply them by the number of papers cited. And so here you can see the results along the y-axis here is percent over and under citation. And then here are the four author categories. So what you can see is that um, papers that have a man in the first and last author position are oversighted by 
uh, in comparison to the random draws model. So zero would be the random draws model probabilities. And then papers that have a woman in the first and last author position are undersighted by 30.2%. I just want to pause there because that's not a small number. And when we think about the conversations that happen around hiring, promotion, tenure, awards, et cetera, a decrease of 30% can have a massive impact. Okay, but now you can also ask, well, you know, is the random draws model what what we actually do. Do we actually draw randomly from the literature? The answer is no. We have some reasons why we choose certain references and not others. So let's consider a different um, base rate model that accounts for some of the features we may care about. So for example, the year of the publication. Maybe we cite a very famous paper from 20 years ago because it was a very famous paper. Um, let's account for the journal in which the article was published. So if it's published in a very high tier journal, that's maybe going to um, increase the number of citations that it's likely to have than a paper that's published in a lower tier journal. The number of authors on the paper, whether the author was a re or the paper was a review article or an empirical study, often review articles are actually cited more. Um, and then number five, the seniority of the paper's first and last authors. Now, I'll note that we don't have direct estimates of someone's seniority. We don't know their age, but what we use as a proxy is the number of papers they have published previously, and that's our proxy for their seniority. Um, and so here you have the percent over and under citation calculated after accounting for these different variables in a generalized additive model on the multinomial outcome of paper authorship in these four categories. So now we have that the man-man papers are oversighted by 5.2%, so that's less than we had estimated before, and the women-women papers are being undersighted by 13.9%. So still a striking um, effect and still in the exact same direction, but less than in the random draws model. Now, the second hypothesis that we wanted to test was that the undercitation of women was, going, was being driven mostly by man-man teams. And that may sound not generous. Um, so I want to preface this by saying that that was motivated by prior work in these other fields that had found something similar. So what we find here is that um, the imbalance within reference lists shown previously is largely being driven by the citation practices of man-man teams. On the um, y-axis is the percent over and under citation just for papers that have a man first and last author. And so what you can see is that these effects are very strong and in fact they're, they're stronger than they were um, in the entire group. So the man-man papers are being oversighted by close to 10% and the women-women papers are being undersighted by over 20%. And then if you look at the citation practices of just papers that have a woman somewhere, either in the first position or in the last position or in both, you can see that those teams tend to cite relatively equitably. Um, so that suggests that the large majority of the imbalance that we're observing in the entire population is being driven by one author group, um, with it, which is the papers of a man in the first position and the man in the last position. Now I want to um, pause again here just to make some statements about logic. So the fact that imbalance is driven largely by the citation practices of man-man teams does not mean that all men-led teams have imbalanced citation practices. It just means that on average, that's the fact. And here is an example of a man who has an opposite um, or someone who is predicted to be a man who has the opposite effect. So what you can see here is what we would expect for the citation practices in the dashed lines, and then the actual citation data from Guy Urban in color. And what you can see is that there's under citation of man-man teams and over citation of women-women teams. So this is the exact opposite of the general category. So um, this is just to indicate the, the difference between um, the, the general performance of a group and the possible performance of a single individual. This is related to the fact that um, just because the women teams are not driving the imbalance does not mean that all women-led teams have balanced citation practices. And again, so that I, I hopefully do not appear terribly ungenerous, I'm gonna show myself as the, as the bad example. So here what you can see is the percent over and under citation along the y-axis. Um, 
and then the four different categories. Um, so in the past, before I knew about this problem, I was significantly undersighting uh, papers that were written by women in the first and last author position. So this is not something that I'm proud of, um, but something that I'm really glad to know and because it's something that I can fix. With every single paper that we now publish, we consider the references extremely carefully and um, make sure that we are canvassing the literature appropriately. All right, so let's test hypothesis number three. We predicted that the imbalance should be decreasing with time because we know that the um, field is becoming more diverse. We know that there are more women in the field. And so we figured, well, if, if there are more women in the field, hopefully this imbalance is going away over time. Unfortunately, we found the opposite. Um, so uh, what we actually found is that the imbalance is increasing with time. And it's particularly increasing most heavily or most strongly in the man-man uh, teams. So here's the per percent over and under citation as a function of year from 1995 to 2018. And, what, and you can see that the man-man teams tend to oversight other man-man teams. That's this purple line here. And that, that over-citation is growing with time. And you can see that they undersight the women-women teams, and that undercitation is getting larger with time. So you can see this spreading out, this like increase in the gap. The gap is widening. If you look at the citation practices of women-women teams, what you can see is that on average, they're citing very close to the zero line, which is the expectation on the base, base rates model of the that includes paper characteristics, like whether it's a review, the seniority of the authors, the year of publication, etc. Um, so that was disturbing um, and again emphasizes the fact that this is something that we should probably address um, sooner rather than later. Now the last hypothesis that we had in this study was to assess the impact of social networks. So prior work has demonstrated that researchers are more likely to work with other researchers of their own gender and that homophily in co-authorship networks can produce biased perceptions of the overall gender makeup of a network. So if you always work with one gender, um, then you might imagine that the whole field is that gender. Um, whereas if you know if you only work with the other gender, you might imagine that the whole field is that that gender. I mean, that's a that's a a gross amplification of the statement, but the point is that your perception of the field may be very dependent on your local neighborhood. And um, so what Jordan did is that he estimated several different characteristics of the co-authorship networks among um, neuroscientists, and he was able to measure an overall over-citation um, estimate of the man-man teams that was due to the the or could be explained by the structure of co-authorship networks. So in color, what you're seeing is um, how much of the citation practices could be predicted by the co-authorship network, and the answer is some. Um, but in the dashed line is what's left over, what's not explained. And so you can see that there's a significant amount of variance that is not explained by the co-authorship network. So to us, that indicates that local homophily explains only part of the over-citation of men by other men. Now let's think about some explanations for these data and also dismiss some non-explanations. So first, the undercitation of women in neuroscience papers could be due to systemic gender bias or to explicit and implicit individual bias relative either to the known gender of an author or to an author's gendered name, as we talked about before in that study of taking the same CV and putting a name on it that's either a man's name or a woman's name. The same is actually true for race and ethnicity, and I'm going to get to that in a couple minutes. Number two, the over-citation of men in course syllabi and conference speaking roles is clearly a factor in gender, racial, and ethnic disparity in academia, but that mechanism alone does not explain the fact that the over-citation of the majority is being driven largely by the majority. Um, so in other words, if we all go to the same um, conferences and we all take the same courses and they have imbalanced um, lineups, then we should all be citing similarly. The fact that genders are citing differently and that most of the imbalance is driven by these man-man -man teams suggests that there's something else going on. Number three, the growing gender, racial, and ethnic gap does not simply reflect authors' propensity to cite older literature from when the field was more majority dominated, as the expected proportions that we use account for the publication year of the articles being cited. So it's not just the fact that we're citing papers from 
past times when um, there were fewer women because that's accounted for inside of the statistical modeling that we're doing. And lastly, the findings are not explained by self-citation. They're not being driven by a single man-dominated subfield, and you can see that in the supplement of the paper. Um, and they're not being driven largely by a few high impact papers rather than being a systemic effect across papers of all impact levels. It's really that the, this is a systemic effect. And again, you can see the supplement of the paper for the data to back up those statements. So I think that the after the paper came out, there's been a very broad community response that's been extremely thoughtful um, and careful and acknowledging the fact that there, this is an area in which there is an imbalance um, and it's an area that we should be addressing as a field. So there's a wonderful early brain editorial, so in the journal Brain, there's an editorial in Nature and Neuroscience called Widening the Scope of Diversity. There's also a perspective from Adrian Fairhall and Eve Martyr, acknowledging female voices. There's a generalization of the results to the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience, which we had not initially studied, but another team um, followed in our footsteps and studied Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience and found the same gender imbalances and citation practices in cognitive neuroscience. And there's also a paper uh, editorial in Nature Reviews Physics called The Growing Citation Gap. So all of these, both acknowledging the, the existence of the finding and also extending it into new areas. Now, once we finished this paper, we thought, well, it can't just be gender. It's very likely that there are other dimensions um, along which people, we know that there are other dimensions along which people can be discriminated against. And it's very possible that um, there will be a signal for undercitation there too. So let's at least test it so that we don't, um, we, we don't dismiss potential other dimensions of difference. So the very big one that probably comes to mind that's important to address next, or even we could have addressed it first in gender second, um, but is race and ethnicity. So this, we know that there is um, racial and ethnic discrimination in academia, in industry, and on the streets. And so it's important to address whether or not there is a citation imbalance that's related to race and ethnicity. So, what we did here is that we followed in the same path as the previous paper, but we extended the data to 2019 um, because this was a little bit, you know, the second study, so we could we could go a little bit further. What we did to assign author race is that we used a publicly available probabilistic database and a deep neural network that learns the relationship between names and racial categories on Wikipedia entries. Um, we also back up these findings using the U.S. Census um, database and also a database uh, that's called the Florida Voter Registration Database. Um, and so there's very consistent results across all three databases. What the algorithm is doing is that it's looking at the linguistic content of the names and specifically looking at by characters, which two um, letters are near one another in the name and what is the probability that that would happen in a given group. The approach allows us to estimate probability distributions across four racial categories, Asian, Black, Hispanic, and White, based on each author's first and last names. So for every person, we have a probability of being Asian, a probability of being Black, a probability of being Hispanic, and a probability of being White. Um, and uh, those can all be uh, non-zero. Across the 63,677 articles, the proportion of articles with a person of color as first or last author based on these predictions significantly increased from 1995 to 2019 at a rate of roughly 0.49% um, per year. What you can see if you um, the rate of increase of the of papers written by women was a little bit higher, so it was 0.6% per year. Um, but you can also, if you go back and look at the, the earlier slide, I'm not going to do it because it's going to take too long, but is that um, there are on average more um, people of color publishing um, than women publishing. And we're sort of ending up here with 50% papers still with man as first and last author, whereas in this, paper, this uh, data set, we have 41% of papers with a white first author and a white last author. So there's some, some slight differences in, in the proportions of um, different genders versus different races and ethnicities. Okay, so I'm going to compare that data to the same two models that I showed you before. So the random draws model and then the paper characteristics model. Here's the random draws model. So along the y-axis is the percent over and under citation. And then here are the four author categories we're gonna care about now. The first one is white, white. So that means white first author, white last author. 
The second category is a white first author and then an author of color in the last author position. The third uh, group is author of color as a first author and a white author as the last author. And then the last group is two authors of color, one in the first position and one in the last position. And in the lighter violins, you see the predictions. If we had um, randomly permuted um, the association of names to races and ethnicities. And uh, what you can see is that on average, though, the papers that have a white first and last author are being oversighted by about 8%. And the papers with an author of color in the first and last author position are being undersighted by 17.2%. And that sounds bad, um, but it's worse if you just look at the behavior of the white citers. So like me, for example. Um, so people like me cite, oversight other white authors by 10.7% and they undersight author of color, authors of color by 24.1%. It's really, that's really, again, just pause on that. It's a lot. It could have a really big impact on people's lives. Um, in the last um, panel, what you see is the citation practices of uh, citers of color. So they also t have a small um, potential to oversight white papers with a white first and last author. So this is 4.3%. And they undersight um, papers with an author of color in both positions by 8%. So that's about a third of what we see in white citers. So the majority of this is still being driven by the the majority group, so white ciders. Um, okay, so then let's compare it to the paper characteristics model. This is the one where we take into account the year of the publication, the journal of the publication, the number of authors, etc. In this model, we've also added the location of the author's institution because that we know that geography um, can uh, impact the kind of distribution of the can also have an effect and 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 explain some of the distributions that we see. So here on the left hand side, again, is oh, percent over and under citation. We see that um, even against the paper characteristics model, papers with a white first and last author are being oversighted by 5.4% and papers with an author of color in the first and last position are being undersighted by almost 10%. And again, it's largely being driven by white citers. So they're oversighting themselves by seven point, we are oversighting ourselves by 7.1% and undersighting people of color by 14.3%. You can see, you know, a slight trend for citers of color to do something similar, but the majority of the effect is being driven by white citers. Now, what's happening over time? Well, what's happening over time is that the gap is widening also. So not just in gender is the gap widening, but in race and ethnicity, the gap is widening too. So in white authors, um, they are oversighting other white authors at an increasing rate over time from 1995 to 2019. And they are undersighting authors of color at, an, at a widening rate. Um, and that's from, again, from 1995 to 2019. If you just look at citers of color, um, you can see on average they're much closer to the zero line, which means that they're citing much more according to the paper characteristics base rate model. But you also do see a trend to increasingly cite white authors and decreasingly cite um, other authors of color. So the, the effect is still here a little bit, but it's definitely not anything close to what we're seeing in the white citers. Now, what about the social network? That was the last part of the gender story. Well, what we see is that racial and ethnic segregation in co-authorship networks is increasing despite greater field-wide collaboration. Um, and I'm not, for time, I'm not gonna get into that, that a finding, but you can look at the paper, the preprints on BioArchive, you can see it there. We also find that the most imbalanced white citers tend to cite more locally within their co-authorship network than the least uh, imbalanced white citers. And um, the most imbalanced citers of color utilized unexpectedly long paths to reach white authors, um, passing over authors of color close to them. So this imbalance is basically when you cite close, you cite nearby, but you when you do extend to longer distances, you're passing over a person of color to cite a white person. Um, so the last question is, is what's happening at the intersection, right? So how does the cost of being a woman and a person of color combine and compound, or does it? Um, and so here is a figure that basically shows you the effect on intersectional identities. So on the x-axis is the um, uh, predicted race and ethnicity of the last author, and then along the y-axis is the first author. 
And what you can see is that there's clear block structure where most of the overcitation, so the red numbers, are in the group of people who have a, a the group of papers that have a man first author and a man last author, independent of race or ethnicity. And the largest set that are undercited is are the papers that have a woman as a last author and a woman as a first author. So this big blue block over here. Uh, so the biggest factor explaining these results is gender. And then within each of those blocks, you can see modulations by race and ethnicity um, in which, uh, for example, the um, white women are being cited, uh, undersighted less than black or Hispanic women. Um, and white men are being oversighted more than um, men of other races and ethnicities. And again, just remember that these effects are largely being driven by the majority race, which is white in this case, and the majority gender, which is man in this case. And both of these effects are increasing with time. So I think that brings me to the question of where do we go from here? I mean, it's kind of heavy. Um, what do we do? And I think it's important when we start asking the question of what do we do is to think about, well, what kind of ethics do we have? And do, well, do we have ethics? Hopefully we have some ethics, um, but what kind of ethics do we have? And I think I would definitely acknowledge and many of my colleagues would acknowledge that the ethics of citation practices remain to be further defined. Um, and potentially writing social inequities could be accomplished on a couple of different models and maybe we should discuss them and figure out which of them makes most sense in this situation. So the first ethical model we could consider is the distributional model where justice refers to the morally proper distribution of social goods and resources, or in this case, citations. And there are two sort of subcomponents of that model. You could work on the equality-based distributed model where citations should be allocated to all authors equally, or you could work on the equity-based distributed model where citations ought to be allocated to authors differentially based on select factors, which may include merit, need, or authority. There's a big limitation, though, to the distributional model, and that is by emphasizing commodity parity across economies of exchange over differential responsibility for histories and structures of inequality. And I think to acknowledge that we do have responsibility for writing histories and structures of inequality, we should consider the difference models instead, which I'm highlighting here in blue. They, by contrast, recommend acts of reparative justice, which might include affirmative action in citational practices, institutional reform to support citation parity, and disciplinary redress of gender or racial or ethnic bias more broadly. What concretely can we do after we've defined an ethics for ourselves? Well, we wrote a paper recently, it's published in Neuron, um, where we give some recommendations, some very concrete recommendations for people in various scientific roles, from creators of the science to arbiters of the science to reflectors of the science. And for the creators, so these are people who are producers, generators, authors, designers, and originators of the manuscripts. They could be the undergrads, research assistants, graduate students, postdocs, research staff, or PIs. If you're in that category, you can ask yourself whether your reference lists are balanced and you can educate yourself on the work of minority scientists. Number three, you can gather information about the current gender and race distributions of authors in your field. Number four, you can determine whether you aim to reflect that current distribution or to proactively cite more work by minority scientists as an act of reparative justice and affirmative action in citation practices. Number five, you could consider appending what we're calling a citation diversity statement um, to your paper. What is a citation diversity statement? We and others have started including this at the end of our paper, um, right after the acknowledgements. And I've highlighted, um, well, here's, here's basically how it goes. So it starts with, recent work in several fields of science has identified a bias in citation practices, such that the papers from women and other minority scholars are undersighted relative to the number of such papers in the field. Here we sought to proactively consider choosing references that reflect the diversity of the field in thought, in the form of contribution, gender, race, ethnicity, and other factors. These are not the only three factors that we should care about. First, we obtain the predicted gender of the first and last author of each reference by using databases that store the probability of a first name being carried by a woman. By this measure and excluding self-citations, our references contain A% this category, B% this category, etc. 
Then we follow with a limitation. This method is limited in that the names, pronouns, and social media profiles used to construct the databases may not in every case be indicative of gender identity, and it cannot account for intersex, non-binary, or transgender people. Second, we obtain predicted race and ethnicity categories of the first and last authors of each reference by databases that store the probability of a first and last name being carried by an author of color. By this measure and excluding self-citations, our references contain this percent of this category, etc. This method is limited in that names, census entropy, and entries, and Wikipedia profiles used to make the predictions may not be indicative of racial ethnic identity, and B, it cannot account for indigenous and mixed race authors or those who may face differential biases due to the ambiguous racialization or ethnicization of their names. We look forward to future work that could help us to better understand how to support equitable practices in science. So why do we include something like this at the end of our paper? Well. Number one, it holds us accountable. <laughs> we actually have to look at our references and we actually, actually have to acknowledge the current uh, distribution and we have to try to fix it if it's something that, that we feel is wrong. Um, and number two, it increases global awareness of citation imbalance. So now everybody who reads our paper can see this little section and say, oh, well, that's interesting. I didn't know that that was a fact, um, and I didn't know that's something that maybe I should care about. I, and to be fair, I didn't know this was something I should care about until Jordan did this study. And then number three, we could point future readers to relevant tools for mitigating disparity. And we've been developing those tools over the last um, year or so, and I'll get to that in a second. But um, all of that can be done if you're in the state of actuality. So here's my Aristotelian bit coming out. If you're in a state of actuality, then um, those are the things you can do. If you're in a state of potentiality, then you can proactively consider, me meaning you um, don't have a paper yet, but you are starting a project. In that case, you can proactively consider fleshing out ideas for minority scholars early in the problem formulation stage so that the work of minority thinkers is in fact central to your questions. Now, what if you're an arbiter? So these are mediators, moderators, and adjudicators of the scientific publishing process, like lab heads, um, journal editors, or reviewers. Well, you can discuss the citation diversity as a team in lab meeting. You could solicit a shared ethics in citation practices as a lab or as a journal policy. You could choose not to open the gate on a paper until that paper has a reference list that the lab or the journal would be proud of. Number four, you could raise awareness by requiring or encouraging a citation diversity statement or something similar. Number five, you could explicitly support the work of minority scientists by inviting them to co-author reviews and author invited papers. Number six, you could assess citation diversity when you perform peer review on other people's papers and suggest the work of minority thinkers to cite. Now, what if you're a reflector? So these are the people who mirror, reflect, or canvas the scientific field for others. They're mentors, instructors, and potentially review authors. Well, we can commit to offering a balanced view of the field as it stands and an increasingly equitable view of the field as it grows and changes. Number two, we could facilitate summer research programs and collaborative research between young and established URM scholars. Number three, we could check our syllabi for underrepresentation, <clears throat> introduce students to relevant URM work. And finally, for review authors, consider expanding your own and others' sense of the field by consciously including and in some cases highlighting <clears throat> the work of minority scholars. Um, so those are things that we can each do depending on um, where we are in this whole scientific process. We also have, over the last few years, developed some additional tools for mitigating disparity. Those include the citation diversity statement, and that was Jordan's idea, actually. Um, but they also include software for gender and racial and ethnic predictions, um, and also a Google Chrome extension that also works with PubMed as well. So it works with Google Scholar and PubMed. And it helps when, when a paper is pulled up after you search for some um, keywords, you uh, receive information about the probability that the authors are men versus women. And that can help you just to kind of flag, oh, make sure I don't overlook the paper that was written by a woman. Make sure that that's something that I can use to educate myself about the work of minority scholars. And then also Max, who led the, the second study on um, racial and ethnic imbalances, 
and he has a GitHub page. So if you like Python scripts, go here. Um, and if you like a internet, a, a, just an executable from any internet browser, browser go to this uh, page here. Um, OK, and then I think to, to sort of conclude, I want to quote Maya Angelou, who said, the truth is no one of us can be free until everybody is free. And I think that's a call. It's a call that it's time for a state transition in mind. It's time to change the meaning of the word scientist to us as a community. A scientist is not a white, cisgender, heterosexual man. A scientist is anyone who is seeking to understand how the natural world works. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge the people who are extremely important in this work. I have, I mean, there's not even enough space to include everybody, um, but the first study was led by Jordan Dworkin. We collaborated with Professor Perry Zern, um, who has expertise in gender, race, and ethnicity theory. Um, he's a philosopher at American University. Jenny and Dale have been developing uh, the um, tools, software tools. Max is led the second study in race and ethnicity imbalances. Takishin O'Hara and Kristen Lin are in the biostatistics department here at the University of Pennsylvania and were extremely in instrumental in the first uh, paper in the gender domain. Erin was also involved in that study as well and contributed. And then um, in the final study on race and ethnicity, um, Tony, Damien, Lucina and Kaf, um, and actually several others who are not listed here were very important in helping us to um, really make this study uh, meaningful uh, to people of, of every background and with and I just we couldn't have done it without them so with that um, thank you so much for listening I would be happy to take questions Wow thank you so much um, please type your questions in the chat or um, you can unmute yourself and just ask here I have a question. Let's see. I'm sorry, my video is off. Hi, Danny. It's Ron Mangan. Hey, um, I love that talk. It was beautifully presented and fascinating material. Um, I was really struck, as you were, um, you used the word disturbing, and I'll say the word disturbing and fascinating, the trends over time. I mean, you, you didn't go, you weren't talking about like 1950 to 19, you know, to 2000. You're talking 2000 or, or later to, to the present, right? Yeah. And um, I didn't understand, uh, you know, what your thoughts were about what, what could be driving that. Because it just, you know, I would, if you would have asked me, you know, what's your bet? Let's mm -hmm. put $5 on it. I would have said, well, it's got to be getting better. Yeah. Yeah, that was our bet too. I mean, our hypothesis was the opposite and we were proven wrong. <laughs> so yeah, why is it happening? That's a really good question. Um, uh, I'll give you one story. There's, I, it's possible that people are citing based on citations they see in someone else's paper and they're just kind of very quickly saying, oh, well, these people cited that for that reason and so I'll just put that citation in here. And so there's this snowballing effect of citing without really thinking. Um, and maybe, although that wouldn't necessarily, that, that could decrease the number of papers that we're actually citing um, and that there's much more con shared, that we're all citing the same ones, but not for a good reason necessarily, not for a reason that's relevant to the science. Um, but there's also the fact that maybe we are increasingly in echo chambers where we are co-authoring with a few other people and we're citing their papers and our papers. And that's kind of this little group that just becomes more and more isolated from the rest of the community. And maybe there was greater um, integration before. Another idea is that we are using um, search engines like Google Scholar to find papers and you know maybe those search engines don't help us to canvas the field accurately perhaps um, there's a lot more literature than there used to be and so if we're kind of a little bit sloppy or don't really pay a lot of attention or don't choose to read each paper that we cite or search for the really the right paper to cite then um, we could fall into these maybe low energy minima that um, are biased. So that those are all possibilities. Um, I think more work is needed to really 
explain the findings. The fact that the co-authorship networks are helping us to explain it at least a bit suggests to me that these echo chambers are a more likely explanation than some of the others. Um, but I also guess as I was looking at the data, I, I realized that, you know, we spend so much time on every single sentence in the paper. We rewrite it multiple times. We carefully pick every word. We pick every color for every figure. We go over it many, many times. Um, but the reference list kind of, you know, doesn't usually have that much attention paid to it. And I'm not convinced that we take as much care there as we do in all the rest of the sections. And so it's possible that the, that lack of care comes out in a in a um, yeah in a biased way that just reflects it reflects the biases that we all have. And I'll I'll put myself right in there because um, because my citation practices were not good before I knew this. Thanks, um, I want to get to a few more questions in the chat. Um, Rebecca asks, um, has there any been, has there been any work done to compare bias between different fields? Um, like fields have been around longer than others, or I guess my addition to this is STEM versus art or, uh, or yeah, art and science fields. <laughs> Yeah, well, there is there are some studies in international relations, um, communications, and political science, which um, I'm not sure if I would really say that those are art, but they're definitely not um, typical of what we would think of as you know physics and art science, for example, math. So, um, and they see very similar effects. So, I I think that it could be more much more general. We obviously the field hasn't canvassed all all of these different areas. So it's still maybe too early to tell, but so far it's pretty, it, in the places that it's popped up, it's, or been dis studied, it's very consistent. So that's interesting. Now, what to do about different subfields. One thing I would definitely recommend if you're interested in this is that in both papers in the supplement, we have a section where we studied the, just the Journal of Neuroscience, which um, has a uh, tag for each paper based on its subfield. So um, maybe it's um, behavioral and cognitive science, it's molecular and cell biology, it's systems neuroscience, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of different tags for little subfields of neuroscience. They're not little subfields, big subfields of neuroscience. And so we take that into account in the statistical model um, and we can we still see the, the overall effect holds, both in terms of gender and in terms of race and ethnicity. So to us, that suggests that this is not something that differs by subfield in neuroscience. It's something that's more systemic. Um, great. I will get to a few more questions from the chat. Um, Brendan asks, uh, have you tested for any relation between the change in the base rate of publication by historically underrepresented groups and the increase in citation disparity over time? Um, the change in the base rates. I don't think I'm following your question. Sorry, I can I can clarify the question. Uh, sorry, it was a little confusing. <laughs> uh, thanks for thanks for your incredible talk. Um, so I was just thinking, like, what if it's possible, like, like if I'm going to be super optimistic about getting better, like, in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, I would think, well, maybe there are just more people from these historically underrepresented groups who are publishing over time, and maybe that's why, like, if these biases already exist, and maybe the biases are just not changing, therefore, the, the sort of rate of citing them is going down as a result. Um, I don't know if you've tested for that. We have, yes. Thank you for the question. So that's part of the temporal section of both papers. I just showed you one figure, the top part of that figure, but there are several sub panels underneath of there that, that from which we infer that the largest amounts of under citation are being driven by groups that are citing kind of um, the way they've always cited since 1995, even though the actual state of the field has changed significantly, meaning state of the field by meaning the percentage of papers that are out there by um, minority genders or races and ethnicities. So yes, your inkling is, is consistent with what we're seeing in both cases. Thank you. Um, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, and Catherine asks, um, 
have you found that your work investigating these inequities has been supported well by funding agencies and organizations? And if so, do they seem uh, interested in continuing to support this kind of investigation? Um, that's a great question. The, the work is not yet funded. Um, so we are searching for funding uh, now. There are pay places, programs in the National Science Foundation that support science of science work. Um, and so that's a that's a place where we did submit a grant. Um, it got decent scores, but was not in the end funded. So we'll be revising that and resubmitting it for a February deadline. And then there is also a place, uh, a um, section in NIH that is also devoted mostly to um, the effect of gender imbalances on women's health. And so that's another place that we've been um, recommended to apply. So that is some we are hoping to fund it because I think it's really important work and I hope that it keeps it keeps going. The people who have done it so far have been doing it kind of on their own time. Um, and that's, yeah, eventually, hopefully we can make this bigger and better. Great. Um, in the interest of time, uh, I think we're going to uh, wrap up. Sorry to all the questions that we could not address from the chat. Um, Lindsay will make a quick uh, statement about um, future events and programs for SOMA. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, this is just a super quick announcement. Uh, we have another event coming up in two weeks, and it's particularly aimed at enhancing your representation uh, in STEM, it's a fellowship writing workshop um, panel. So we'll have uh, several people who generally review these grants at the panel, and they will give their tips and tricks on, on how to get them. And so URMs are very encouraged to apply and attend. Um, it's free, uh, but of course the event is welcome for everyone. And that's all, thank you. Great, uh, so we will stop the recording um, and the talk portion of this meeting is over.